All right. Welcome back, everyone. This is Pastor Jung here at Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. And uh, thank you for joining us here um, as we continue on in our study on the book of Ephesians, um, chapter 3, uh, verses 8 to uh, probably 13. Um, thank you for joining me this day, and um, I pray that uh, this word will go well with you. Um, and again, if you've missed uh, some of our Bible studies, please go on our YouTube channel, uh, Faith Moore Park, uh, Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, and, um, or faithmoorpark.com, um, and you will find all the previous Bible studies along with sermons, along with our other Bible study on Sundays about question and answers, along with all the other devotions that we do um, in the rest of the week there on the YouTube channel. So please check that out and just uh, press play, listen to it. Um, if you are unable to sit down and, and, and listen to it, uh, listen to it in the car, listen to it uh, while you're uh, uh, getting things prepared in the house or at work or wherever it may be, uh, another opportunity for everyone to listen uh, to the Word of God because that is our faith, the Word of God. Okay, why don't we begin here uh, with, with a prayer uh, before we study God's Word. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless. And without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word that by due diligence and right discernment, we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, let us continue here. Today, uh, we continue on with Ephesians chapter 3. Last week, we stopped around verse 8 as we spoke of uh, who St. Paul is in terms of his posture, right? Um, and this is very important. Uh, St. Paul was never putting himself on a pedestal as if he was the number one guy. But rather, he says right here in verse 8, what does it read? If you have your Bibles out, uh, read along with me. You should have your Bibles out. That's always good, right? Reading is fun. So here we see in verse 8, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints. Again, least. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15, where, where he describes himself as the least of the apostles in terms of because he persecuted the church. But there is something about the least where, uh, as we talked about last week, I believe, with St. John the Baptist or, or first and last, humbled and exalted. Increase Decrease. Oh wow, that's dark. All right, that's an old pen. This is the new one. All right, we'll use this. But we see uh, the encouragement. Why is there the encouragement when we see St. Paul saying he is the least, he is the last, he is the humbled, and as St. John would say, he must increase, I must decrease, that St. Paul is at the decrease. What is it about these very positions, this posture where we find the great encouragement? After all, it's interesting because no one wants to be the least, no one wants to be last, no one wants to be humbled, no one wants to be uh, in this decreased state because this, when it comes to encouragement, uh, those probably aren't the words that you want to hear. But... Why is, why are these words in terms of the nature of God and His grace? How does this all work? It's interesting, I did a Bible study uh, on Wednesday uh, in the morning and night, and I'm doing the same one for you here on YouTube, but I definitely didn't start out this way. So, for those that came to Bible study at church, hey, this is another nugget for you. 
uh, to really glean on upon uh, verse 8. But when we look at the nature of God and His grace, we know it's all about His grace. Like for St. Paul, the Damascus Road was all of grace. It was the Lord that has come to him, Saul, Saul. It is the Lord who converts him. It is the Lord who brings him to faith. And in other words, it's not about St. Paul. It's not about what he brought to the table. But simply, Acts 9, as a what? Chosen instrument of God. That he would be the mouthpiece that would proclaim the gospel to all the nations. as the least, as the last, as the humbled, as one who decreased. And this is kind of the pivot point to which we see the ending all the way to uh, verse 13 of our section this day, uh, because this is one of great encouragement. And that's what we're going to really continue uh, to talk about today um, as we live uh, in this life of faith. So uh, here we see in verse 8, uh, to me, though I am very least of all the saints, this grace was given. Remember, my grace is sufficient for you, right? Uh, uh, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Weakness. Another one, right? Brokenness. Another one. All these words, what? Depend upon the grace of of God. The life of what? The life of faith. And when we speak of uh, why this is encouraging, it's because our encouragement, well, is rooted right here as we see, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. All right, so when we talk about the grace of God and, and the, the, the gift that he gives us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the empty tomb, uh, of course, the crucifixion, we know that our faith is rooted in what has been given to us by the unsearchable riches of our Lord. This gospel that we have is so radical and profound and beyond ourselves. That just as St. Paul was searched out by the Lord, just as our Lord searched you out by the blood of Christ, by the one who searched you out by your baptism, this is your posture. Because if it's not God who's searching you out, what happens? Our pride, our arrogance says, nope, I'm first. I'm the exalted one. I'm the increased one. I'm the goat, greatest of all time. I'm, I'm the strong one. I have it all together. I'm not the least, but I'm the greatest. Look at me. Look at all my righteousness. Look what I've done in my life. I'm a good person. I've done this. I've done that. And soon enough, what happens? Grace is no longer in the picture. The cross and the empty tomb, your baptism, the supper, all this has gone to the wayside as you trust in yourself. And at the end of the day, where is that encouragement in light of the true depravity of our flesh? We're left in despair and terror, right? So when we talk about St. Paul, what a great model to which he says, I am the least. Sorry, it sounds like I'm preaching, does it? Anyways, <laughs> hey, I love what I do, right? Anyways, uh, verse 9, and that's where we're going to start today. Uh, why don't you read this with me? And to bring to light for everyone... What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? So when we speak of uh, encouragement, verse 9, God created all things. Why not just some things? Creatio ex nihilo, right? Created out of nothing. All things created by God. The mystery that was hidden for ages. This plan was given by who? The one who created all things. What uh, part of the creed is this? Of course, Article 1, creation, right? 
your members, your senses, your daily bread, your spiritual protection. Why does he do this? Because he is the all-powerful one, all out of his uh, fatherly divine goodness without any merit or worthiness in me. And God creates all things. He is the doer. That's what it means. He is the doer. His will is done. Uh, he is the one who controls all things. Uh, the way to which is fulfilled by the sending of the Son, this is all done by the will and act of God, His mercy. So we see right here in verse 9, um, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of salvation or what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages. Right? So, so when we talk about what was hidden for ages, what this means is the light. God created all things. We know that. Genesis chapter 1, um, uh, the, the start of creation. We, we also know uh, that uh, in this creation, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were there, of course, because they were before. Uh, they are the I Am. And, and, and we, we definitely know that uh, in John 1, we see uh, that proof, but also it shows us that, again, God, His will, ever since uh, the beginning, right? Um, Jesus was not created. Let's be clear on that. Jesus, repeat after me, was not created. Again, Jesus was not, N-O-T, created, right? But He is God. And this is the will of God to send his son. This is, as we talk about later in a couple of verses later, the eternal purpose. Now, why do I say this? Because in the Old Testament, there's Jesus, right? Whether it be from uh, uh, Genesis 3, the Proto-Evangelion, right? The, the first gospel. That ever since the fall, he would, from an offspring of a woman, would come the savior of the world. We talk about the tabernacle in the Old Testament, we we speak of um, we speak of, of course, before that the Passover lamb, right on the kickoff to the Exodus. We also talk about all the prophets, and, and there's many examples of how this is the hidden uh, hidden plan uh, for the ages to come. And this would all kind of go towards John chapter one. The word dwelt among us, skeno, which means the world, uh, the word tabernacled from the Old Testament tabernacle, right? The presence of God. Here the presence of God was with them as the Passover lamb, John 129. Behold, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And also the prophets in the Old Testament, what were they all doing? Pointing to uh, the fulfillment of the advent of Christ. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that as we know him to be as the true prophet, the true priest, and the true king. Right? So this is what was hidden, and it was brought to light by the very word of God. And that word of God is who? Jesus. I know, sorry, my notes on the board are going haywire today. It's getting late in my... Um, my organizational skills are going down the tubes. But here we see uh, the point, right? That for what is to come that was hidden is now being made known. And that known is Jesus as light. Now, why does the world need light? Because there is obviously darkness. Hey Zoe, can you get me a paper towel real quick? There's all, obviously darkness, and uh, this is what was to be revealed. The eternal light to all the world, all by the grace of God, who created all things, because the nature of God, of course, is His merciful love for you, and by His acting as the subject of the verb, he gives you his grace, and that is ultimately Christ, which was revealed uh, from the hidden ages that uh, was to come by his will. And there they are in this time during the time of the Ephesians, right? So again, in context, St. Paul is under house arrest, and he is reminding them what? What is he talking about here? He's pointing them to the Lord. You know, I... I look at St. Paul and 
you know, of course, we know he is a great, he's a great example of faith, just great everything in the Bible. But here we see how important it is in a sense of what it's all about. It was never about him. When it comes to this enduring encouragement, who does he address here? It's all about Jesus. It says right there, so that through the church, verse 10, follow along with me, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Right? And here we see through the church, the wisdom of God. What is the wisdom of God? That is Jesus himself through the church as the cornerstone. The wisdom of God is to unite the Jew and Gentile, something so radical in the human flesh. But yet the Lord's wisdom is the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And there they would be united, being made known to the heavenly realms. Right? It's like when we uh, speak in the liturgy uh, in the proper preface, uh, before we see, uh, before we sing the Sanctus, um, with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, "Holy!" That song, right? Uh, and uh, what a great, uh, 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 joy that is uh, to make known and, and to live in the mystery that was revealed. Um, in the body and blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And again, this is the encouragement. So we see in verse 8, what is it? The unsearchable riches of God. Verse 9, what do we see about our encouragement? We see uh, uh, that we can be assured, right? Assurance through the Maker of all things. The maker should be capitalized, right? In verse 10, what do we see right here? We see uh, the wisdom of God, his will. So again, why is this encouragement? Because this is all about God. At the end of the day, our encouragement is not just a simple platitude like, oh, things are going to get better or, or, you know, just try harder. Tomorrow's a new day. No. St. Paul's encouraging them in the midst of this arrest that this is who you are. And you know that because of the one who has given you this promise. I know, into it, right? Anyways, my daughter's here. Uh, but, uh, and I love her dearly. I do. Anyways, um, verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 11. Eternal purpose. We talked about it earlier. God created all things. The Alpha and and the Omega. Eternal purpose. Encouragement. Why is the eternal purpose our greatest encouragement? You know, uh, what is it about microscopes? Uh, that, you know, microscopes can see things very closely. The focus goes in and you can see every microbe on, on the, uh, you can see every bacteria, you can see everything, right? But in our sinful nature, sometimes we do get too fixed on the trees in the midst of the forest, right? We get lost in the trees, right? We get so fixated on the temporary. We get so fixated on the situation that is at hand. St. Paul really is showing them, look at the big picture here. The eternal purpose of God, all right here, the encouragement in the midst of, you know, to not lose heart. Gentiles, remember this. The big picture is your salvation. The big picture is your life written by the blood of Christ. 
by, your, by the forgiveness that he has given you, that you are in his name, that you are heirs to his kingdom, citizens of God, you are his children. And in this eternal purpose, as we dwell upon the promises of God in the gospel, even in the baptismal life and the supper that we feed on, the bread of heaven, every week, we dwell upon what is eternal, what is true, and what is forever. You know, friends, it's easy to get lost in the temporary. I trust me, I know. As a pastor, honestly, oof, there are moments. But then you step back and say, wait, what does the revealed will of God, what does it say in Scripture? And that points us to the eternal purpose, right? that is realized or that is carried out or that is executed or accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not just Jesus. It's Jesus for you. It's not just Jesus as a CEO or model or, or guru or something to follow, but it's Jesus for you, his sacrifice. His coming into this world, His eternal purpose actively and passively obedient, His humiliation, His exaltation, His flesh, His divinity, His nature as God, as man. The eternal purpose is the salvation for your soul. And that's what He does for you. Right? And this is our encouragement. Now, does it mean that we don't suffer? No. Can't promise you that. Actually, we will suffer, right? And we do. The flesh, the world, the devil. Attack, attack, attack. Yet, even in the midst of those circumstances, the eternal purpose is what? To crush the devil's head. Genesis 3, right? He will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. Eternal purpose is your eternal life. Eternal purpose is your name written in the book of life. And thus, as St. Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And, you know, when we speak of the encouragement of our Lord, as we're rooted in his death and resurrection, remember Romans 6, right? Whoever is baptized into Christ is, is connected to his death, and whoever is um, in his death will also be uh, raised into this newness of life. Sorry, I didn't get that Bible verse correctly uh, by word, but, but the point is that we are connected to the death and resurrection of our Lord, and that is his eternal purpose. What a great encouragement that is, right? Because you know what I'm talking about. You know the struggles within yourself, within your relationships, within your conscience, uh, within the terrors of the flesh and all these battles that we face. St. Paul is saying, look at what God has given to you. This is where your faith trusts. This is such a meaty text. I love the Bible, right? It's so great. And we see it right here, executed and carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not carried out by you, right? Not carried out or done or accomplished. No, nothing of you here. Nothing of St. Paul. Only Christ, the eternal purpose, executed, carried out by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So good. So good. Verse 12. What does it say right there? Why don't you read that with me? in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Why do I emphasize, as I'm going to do right now, in? Because this language, as St. Paul always writes about, this in Christ how we are grafted in his name, a point to the, a pointing to the sacramental Uh, faith uh, that is of baptism. But here we see, where do we find, uh, as Jesus Christ executes and carries out salvation for us, it is by his carrying out, his 
faithfulness, as he executes uh, this work for us by going to the cross, by shedding his blood, three days later, destroy this temple, three days later, I will raise it up again. If Jesus was not raised, our faith is futile and we would still be in our sins. Yes, because of his resurrection, all that has been forgiven, all that has been overcome, and we are reigning triumphant all in the end. And this is our encouragement in the end. In whom? We have boldness and access with confidence. In boldness, confidence. And this is our in, the access. Jesus. Now what is confidence? You know, confidence is simply assurance. You know, if you're preparing yourself for an exam or you're preparing yourself for a, a report for your company, you're not just going to wing it. Like, my daughter's not going to just, uh, oh, we have a test tomorrow. Uh, you know, no studying. I'll get it. Will she be confident that morning? I'm pretty sure she'll be very nervous. If you go into a, a, a conference with all the major uh, people of your company to produce a important report for the year, you're going to rehearse, you're going to repeat, you're going to go over the main steps the week before, the night before, and you're going to repeat, 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 so that you are confident as you enter into that meeting. Now, in the same way, it is actually the opposite. It is what has been done for us freely by His grace that we are bold and confident in the access that was given to us, and that is the blood of Christ, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. That our confidence is rooted in Him, in His work. And that's our constant encouragement. I, I, say, I emphasize this because I know, we all know what is at hand in our flesh in the world of the devil. We know, we know this. I know right now you're saying, of course, of course, amen, amen, right? This is most certainly true. But at, at, the, at the other end of the, on the flip side, we very well know what we're up against. The devil, the world, and they're constantly trying to turn us, discourage us. And how does the devil discourage us? By turning us away from the reality and objective truth that our Lord has given to each and every one of us in his unsearchable riches, in the assurance as the one who created all things, in the wisdom of God, his will, the eternal purpose that is Jesus, and in him we have boldness and confidence, for he is the access. As our faith is in him. All right. One more verse. Verse 13. So I ask you not to lose heart what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Sorry, before we get there. Boldness and confidence, catechetical moment. Who loves the catechism? I do. Anyways, introduction to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true Father and that we are his true children. So that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children, ask their dear father. You know, we have that boldness and confidence because our intercessor is the access, which is Jesus. Because of Jesus, I am made his own. Right? I am made his own to be his own. And I live under his care as his child. You know, it's not like my kids, before they ask me something, they're not wondering if they're my own children. They ask because they're my children, right? They're not asking, wait, have I done good enough? Can I boldly ask my parents for something? Or do I have to do something for that? Right, and, and again, you know, we're talking about confidence and, and, and going to the Lord or with prayer, with petitions, right? With the word. Uh, we proceed through the access in Him, boldness and confidence. 
as children of God, as those who are covered by his blood. All right. So the next time you say our Father, dwell upon that for all eternity. What a great gift that is to say our Father in the one true faith. Wow. Anyways, verse 13. So I ask you not to, what is it? Lose heart. Verse 13. Over what I am suffering for you. My mentor, Dr. St. Bile. Love Dr. St. Bile. Uh, he wrote a really good devotion called Christ in Calamity. Um, I encourage every one of you to read that. Um, I know people at church here, we read it together in devotions every week. But I encourage you to get that book, Christ and Calamity, because in that book he talks about suffering. And he really points it back to St. Paul and his suffering in a sense where, very well as we see right here in verse 13, do not lose heart. Because they could have very well lose heart over what they had saw in St. Paul as he was under arrest, what I am suffering for you, for you, which is your glory. Do not lose heart because of all this. All by the grace of God. God to man. Jesus Christ. This is this is who you are, all by the grace of God is gift. And through faith, do not lose heart because you are in him, in all that he has given to you in this eternal encouragement of the faith. There's many reasons to be discouraged, but when we look in faith outside of ourselves, here we see the treasure trove, the lavish riches of God's grace. So St. Paul is saying, do not lose heart for the suffering I am facing for you, which is your glory. Now, do not lose heart because even in his suffering, what's happening? He's going back to the suffering of Christ. That in our suffering, we are connected always in this life of faith to the suffering of Christ on the cross. That though we have sorrows, though we have shame, though we have iniquity and transgression, there our Lord in our suffering, and yes, he was persecuted in all these different things, what doesn't change is the suffering that Christ endured on that very cross for the forgiveness of your sins. That is where we lose or do not lose heart. You know, it's not about following, you know, uh, the cult of the person, you know, the cult of personality. You know, we're not following uh, the pastor, right? Uh, but rather, the pastor is the under shepherd of God. He is simply a mouthpiece of the living word that we just talked about here in verse eight to twelve, right? And that's the beauty of uh, of being, I think, uh, of being Lutheran is that no matter what happens. Us pastors, we all do the same thing, and that is this posture. Oops, I erased it, right? Of being the least, of being the decreased ones, of being the humbled ones, right? Because it's all about Jesus. It's not about what the pastor brings to the table. It's not his innovative technique. It is not his personality or whatever you want to say about him. But rather, at the end of the day, it is the word that he proclaims, and that is the word of God. And that's what St. Paul's doing here, right? Paul, Apollos, God gives the growth, right? Whoever you follow, it's, it's God who gives the growth. And therefore, he tells them not to lose heart. Friends, I know, though we're not in the, uh, in the feet of the Ephesians, we very well know uh, the battles that are at hand for us. And losing heart, losing hope, being in despair, uh, being in great darkness and discouragement is easy. It's easy to dwell in. 
But it's in those very moments, where do we flee? To revealed, to the revealed word of God. I know I'm saying revealed word of God because on Sunday, question and answers, we're talking about predestination and we're talking about the revealed will of God. So I think that's why it's fresh on my mind because I just finished that handout today for Sunday. Um, but check that out if you'd like about predestination uh, on, on our live YouTube um, on Sunday. But for us here, this is the revealed will of God, the suffering of Christ. And therefore, we do not lose heart because our Lord has overcome the world by his death and resurrection. And no matter what is happening in St. Paul, what he is saying right here is, it's all about the mystery that was hidden, but now revealed. And now in him, you have boldness and confidence in the access that was given to you in the one true faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate you, Romans 8, from the love of Christ, right? And that is your encouragement. I know you know it. But at the same time, I know my flesh. I know probably your flesh. We're all from the same parents, Adam and Eve. We know what we face. And how do we face it? Not a platitude of encouragement. But the concrete promise of God's word and all that he gives. And there we proceed in the one true faith, in the one who created all things, in the one who by his unsearchable riches has searched you out by his very blood, the one who gives you the assurance because he is God and he is the maker of all things by his wisdom. And that eternal purpose will always be now, yesterday, and tomorrow, Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not lose heart, because there in Christ by his blood, you know who you are as you live under the good shepherd who laid his life down for you. So remember that this day. A lot of good stuff here about encouragement. And I say that because we need to hear this time and time again. Because so easy do we turn to the other things of this world, whether it's for encouragement or discouragement. Right? But here in the Word, we get back to what? Outside of ourselves the one who's doing the work by his grace, mercy, and steadfast love for you. And that is our Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, we will end there this day. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Thank you for joining us. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, bless us in this word as we dwell within it richly. Lord, we know of your profound grace, how unsearchable it is. Yet, O oh Lord, by your, by your Son, the sending of your Son, you have given to us the great gift of comfort, that is, eternal life, forgiveness, and salvation by your very cross. Bless us, O oh Lord, in this encouragement, knowing full well that we do not lose heart because of your faithfulness, that we live, move, and have our being according to your resurrected name. Bless us this day and grant us your eternal encouragement in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we pray. Amen. All right, friends. Until next time. Love you all. Praying for you all. Read the word. Go to church. Receive the gifts. And there we will find our great encouragement. But until then, join us next week as we continue on in the book of Ephesians. And may God be with you. And may you now go in his peace. All right, friends. See you next time. Adios. And goodbye.